Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editorial Director of Semiconductor Manufacturing and Design. I'm here at Global Foundries with the CEO, Ajit Manocha. Ajit, you've talked quite a bit about Foundry 2.0. What exactly is that? You know, foundry industry started in late 80s, and people didn't think that foundry industry will actually go anywhere. People were still very much focused on IDM type model, where everything was done in-house. So with the formation of foundry industry, it has really given virtual death to IDM. And basically two industries have created, uh, one is Fabulous and Foundries. Now for so far, the Foundries and Fabulous have been working as customer supplier kind of relationship, where customers will bring their design, give it to the Foundries, and Foundries will do the manufacturing and give the parts back to them. The supplier customer relationship is becoming a challenge going forward. M many reasons, but some of the key reasons are complexity in technology, complexity in design, and the changing business requirements of new products, especially in the mobile era, where we need to launch products first time right in high volume like a blockbuster movie. So because of this complexity, it is becoming very difficult for foundries to simply do it as a customer supplier model. So in Global Foundries, we have created a, a new model called Foundry 2.0, which really brings customers closest to us by early and deep collaboration with customers. This has really helped customers to work with us like they're working in a virtual IDM environment. And customers are really embracing this, it is helping not only on getting the product right into the market, but also helping the entire supply chain. You know, speaking of some of the complexity that, that you're dealing with right now, you've got FDSOI, you've got bulk, and you've got the Subalta approach. Where do they stack up? Is one more important than the other? How do you look at that? You know, the three approaches you talked about for the device architect. Let me start with the bulk first. That is our primary platform. Most customers are on bulk platform, and that's where we're committed to support bulk and remain competitive in this industry for bulk platform. That works node after node after node. In our Foundry 2.0, when we talk about early collaboration, when some customers have specific applications, we are very open to work with our customers to support them. Now, both technologies you talked about, the Sue Volta technology as well as FDSOI, they really bring some value to the customers. For example, FTSOI, fully depleted SOI substrate, with that on a 28 nanometer node, you can get power and performance advantage of 20 nanometer. So you basically get one node advantage with FDSOI technology. We have been working very closely with ST. We have seen the early data, it looks very promising. And those customers who are engaged with ST and us, we are fully committed to support them. On Suvolta, this is super steep retrograde well that also provides similar advantages, but on bulk. So those who are kind of uh, not uh, happy about going into SOI platform or SOI substrate, they can stay on bulk and follow the Suvolta technique. Now, we have seen some early results of Suvolta. They're looking very promising, and we're working with Suvolta, and we'll be very happy to work with the customers who really want to embrace that technique. You know, looking at uh, bulk, at least for the moment, uh, the, the new technology that's out there is FinFETs, the 3D transistor structure. Where are we now? The last we had heard, we were at risk production on that. As we said uh, about device architect, going from 20 nanometer to 14, the major change is going from planar to, to three-dimensional transistor design, which is the FinFET. Global foundries has more than 10 year experience working with our research partners and a uh, lot of talent inside the company. We've done a lot of work on FinFET and our work is making, is really showing good performance on the transistors, good performance on the in this SRM yield, and we are ready to roll it out. But the risk production is planned for uh, middle of next year. We've heard a lot about stack die, both the two and a half D, the three D with uh, through silicon vias and then also something that seems to be emerging in between, which is a uh, probably a planar type of uh, stack die where you have some things that are running with TSVs and some things that are running through an interposer. Wh where is that right now? 
you have uh, basically addressed my presentation in a full, full in a full way. I talked about big four. One 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 of the big fours is the device architect. We already addressed that. Other one is the uh, 450. I'm sure you're going to be asking me that question in a minute. And the third one is the packaging. And the fourth one is the EUV and uh, uh, multi-patterning. Now, I think you asked me before, and I didn't address that question on multi-patterning. Now, let me first take care of that, and then I'll come to the to the to this stack die uh, topic. So, multi-patterning. Our 14 nanometer and 20 nanometer are virtually identical, with the exception of the transistors. What that means is that whatever the multi-patterning we do on 20 nanometer is going to be no different on 14. Hence, the cost will not go up. And you still get the advantage of power and performance based upon the FinFETs uh, versus the 20 nanometer planar uh, transistors. Now, on the stack dies and the packaging, we have been working very closely with multiple OSAT partners as well as the memory uh, partners to do the TSV uh, through Silicon Via, as well as the stack dies, 2.5D, 3Ds, all these things going on is independent of the node actually. We can offer whatever the solution customer need, whether it's a 28 nanometer or 20 nanometer or 40 nanometer, in all three cases, we can work with customers on whatever the customer's applications are. And again, Global Foundry's model is to work with partners, collaborate with, with customers and partners and this is going quite well. You brought it up. What's going on with 450 millimeter? <laughs> so we are actually a member of the G450 consortium. We are committed to 450. One thing I will say that, as we remain committed, but I don't think Global Foundries, in, in case of Global Foundries, I'll be the first one to build the first 450 fab, millimeter fab, and I will not be the last one to build the last 300 millimeter fab. So we remain committed, and jury is still out, there's still a lot of work has to be done. I think as suppliers claim that they will be ready in 2017 or 18, I hope so. But my personal view is this is a 2020 uh, mission. You know, you've got three major sites, one of which is Singapore, another one in Dresden, another one up in Malta, New York. Where do you see those playing on your different strategies? Yeah, this is really a great question because this really also talks about our value proposition in addition to the Foundry 2.0. As our name is Global Foundries, we actually live our name of with a global footprint. What do I mean by that? If you really look into the IC supply data, they talk about the world's 80% of the semiconductor capacity is in the medium to high risk zones. Risk from the natural disasters like tsunamis and earthquakes and you name it. Fortunately for us, we are part of the 20% low risk zone, Singapore, Germany, and uh, New York. In addition, the one other advantage of these three continents, or three countries you can call it, they're all friendly to the US laws with respect to IP. So we provide not only supply chain security, but also IP security to our customers. They can be totally free of uh, fear and risk on these matters. In addition, we have some overlap from Singapore to, to Germany. For example, Singapore can go up to 40 nanometers now with the special uh, derivatives for the 40 nanometer technologies like non-volatile RF, whereas Germany has 40, 45, 40, and 28, and probably will extend to 20. And New York starts with 32, 28, 20, 14, and will extend to 10. So there is an overlap between one, fab, one location to the other location on the critical nodes and this really provides extra security to our customers from, from the fab uh, sync point of view. Will the same volume and the same number of companies be moving down to the next node and the next node? Yes, they'll probably hit 10 nanometers, but do you foresee the industry heading down this straight Moore's Law path, or are we really going to start changing direction somewhere along the way? I think there are two parts of your question. One is the industry consolidation to the how many companies will be producing on the leading edge nodes. And the second one is Moore's Law, how many com companies will continue to drive the Moore's Law. Let me address the first one first. We already have, I have already shown in slides that 
there are only four companies left in this planet who can manufacture high volume 20 nanometer or 40 nanometer type, type nodes. Two are pure play foundries, us and the other one, and the two other two are the IDMs trying to be foundry as well. Now, time will tell and customers will decide whether they want to stay with pure play foundries or they want to work with IDMs, uh, the other two play players, uh, I can mention the names, Intel and Samsung. So, I don't think it will be easy for other companies to come into a pure play foundry business on this advanced node at this stage because the complexity is so huge, the time to, to the barrier to to come to this kind of uh, technology capability is huge. So the, we used to be like 15, 20 companies in, uh, in this manufacturing business and that has shrunk to only two pure play foundries when it comes to advanced nodes below 28 nanometers. Now Moore's Law, we continue to drive Moore's Law. Actually the big force we talk about, for example, EUV, multiple patterning, Again, we are looking at the ways to reduce the cost of lethal. Packaging is also going to help bring the cost down, and we're going to look. We're looking for a driving Moore's law. 450 is going to be a big one, big factor in driving Moore's law. So, I think the Moore's law still has a lot of potential, a lot of juice left, but there are many other ways. There is also, especially from the packaging and the backend testing, we can do a lot more things to further reduce cost and reduce the cost of a transistor. And we continue to drive that. Cobalt Foundries has also expressed a lot of interest in MEMS. My guess is it's probably tied into the Internet of Things. Is that correct? And also, where do you go if that is correct? Uh, correct on both points. Uh, Internet of Things is definitely driving the, the needs for MEMS, especially in the mobility business. Uh, mobility era is also asking for a lot of devices with, with applications of MEMS type products. And uh, we have strategically uh, made that as part of our uh, integral part of our business. And in Singapore, we are uh, making a great deal of progress in uh, customer designs, customer wins, and growing our business. And we remain committed to MAMS business. Ajit Manocha, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ed. My pleasure talking to you.